It's good to see you again, my friend. Yes, yes. So Harlan and I have met before in uh, Harrogate. At Harrogate Crime Fair. Has anybody been to Harrogate Crime Fair in? Oh, you must go. In the UK. Anyone who likes crime books, if you're ever in the UK in July, that's the one to go to. Yes, it's in, uh, well, it's in Harrogate, which is in the northern part of London. It is a tremendous festival. Shocking, there's a lot of drinking, though, however, going on there. Yes. A lot of drinking. A mutual friend of ours, Richard Osman, this year decided he was going to buy everybody a drink if they said a certain thing at the bar. And literally 20 minutes later, he's like, stop. <laughs> <laughs> he goes on Twitter, he goes, please stop. I've already used up my advance <laughs> in the bar. So it's a, it's a lot of fun. So we're here to talk about Lisa's new book, The Family Remains. And actually, we're not going to talk about the actual book because that's going to bore both of us. Um, but we're going to talk about the writing pro not the book's going to bore us. The book's fantastic. <laughs> I'm sure all of you have read Lisa before, so you know that this is a, it's not a sequel. It is it's a sequel, a it's not part. a sequel. It's a second part. I don't yeah. know if that's different or the same. Yeah, I don't know what I would call it. A part two? Could, yes, you could, yeah. I mean, you could, actually the match is a part two also. But I think you can, you can read both completely separate. You can read them in either order. Don't you think? Yes. Yeah, okay. Just yeah, sure. although I would suggest if you haven't read The Family Upstairs and you've always wanted to read The Family Upstairs, it would be more fun, I think, marginally more fun to read them one after the other. Correct. But you don't have to. Okay, so I'm going to ask the questions I want to ask, though your publicist was kind enough to give some and we'll do it, but I, I always, you know, when I meet another author who I like and whose work I like and keeps me up at night, I want to get into the nitty gritty and I think that always interests people. So most, most times we always claim as writers we hate the question, where do you get your ideas? Mm -hmm. When in reality we don't, I don't really think. But I'm going to ask it in a slightly different way. What was the nugget? What was the seed? What was the catalyst that got this book started? What was the very first thing? You're completely blank okay. and now you have a little something. What was it? Right. So because this is a part two, the seed, the little nugget, came such a long time ago in summer 2017, in fact, um, when I saw a scruffy woman dragging her two children into the private shower block of a posh beach club in the south of France. And I could tell that and there was a big sign that said for use of members only. And I could tell that she wasn't a member. Um, <laughs> and she just, I saw her, I just caught a very brief glimpse of her and something about her, her aura and her energy just captured my imagination. And I just started developing this whole story for why she was taking her children into this private shower block when she shouldn't be. Um, and I couldn't get her out of my head. And I then started seeing this funny repeated vignette inside my head of this woman as a child running barefoot through the streets of Chelsea in a nightdress in the middle of the night. Um, and those two things just suggested that maybe she was running away from something. And I saw this big sort of mansion in the background and that was it. So that was, that's, that was the starting point for the family upstairs, was who is this woman? Why is she in the south of France um, looking a bit desperate? And what was she running away from as a child and th this huge house in Chelsea? So because this is a sequel, right. the, the starting point came a very long time ago. Um, so the starting point for this one is, shall I write a sequel? OK, then I'll write a sequel. <laughs> well, did you, know, did you know when you were writing the first one you were going to write no. a sequel? You had no, no idea. No, I don't so when, write how sequels. How long after you finished it or after the book came out did you decide you were going to write a sequel? <laughs> right. So the book came out in 2019. Um, and shortly thereafter, my inboxes on all my social media platforms filled up with readers saying, is there going to be a sequel? I, there has to be a sequel. Tell me there's going to be a sequel. And I kept writing to them and saying, I don't do sequels. I don't like writing sequels. I really enjoy starting books with a fresh canvas. And then at some point, I just thought, wow, everybody really, really wants a sequel to this book. And I started finding myself saying to readers, I don't know, I'm thinking about it. Um, and then eventually, yeah, probably about six months after it came out, I started saying, yes, OK, I'm going to write a sequel. Um, so yeah, it came uh, 2020, I think, was did it pursue you or did you pursue it? In other words, were you like kind of at night and something was kind of just 
you know, kind of going, I'm not, you're not done with me. Yeah, there was, well, there was a moment when I finished writing The Family Upstairs where I, I was very conscious of the fact that I'd opened a door at the end of the book. Right. And I hadn't meant to, it was a complete accident, which might have given the impression that I was going to write a sequel um, when I hadn't had any intention of doing that. <laughs> so I was always aware of that, but it wasn't until, as you say, at night time, which is, you know. Right, not good. When, yeah, li good. Li little light that. bulbs go off in the middle of the night sometimes, when I thought I could introduce a whole new storyline and a whole new character into this sequel which would make it more fun for me as a writer because I don't know about you you've done standalones and and yeah. pairs um, and there is a, a pure joy in starting out with a whole new world to create right. um, and so once I realized there was a way of bringing a whole new world into the book with a character called Rachel Rimmer that was when I thought okay I can do this and I know how to make it work and I know how I'm going to make it fun for me as well as satisfying for all the readers who'd wanted me to write a part two. Yeah, I say with a series versus a standalone or a sequel or a second book, it's like a painting. Like one you're starting with a completely blank canvas and you can yeah. go anywhere. The second one you're starting with a giant canvas that part of it has been filled in, but you kind of like the parts that have been, yeah. been filled in already. Is that kind of yes. how it felt a little bit? Yes, it did feel like that. It did feel like there was an awful lot of stuff there that I, I wanted to complete it, basically, yes. And the blank bits were the most enticing for me. Right, of course. The bits of like, I mentioned that character back in chapter four in the first book, but I never followed through on them. Um, so those were the really interesting bits to, to revisit the sort of, and that's where Rachel Rimmer came in as a, someone with a throwaway line at some point in the book, but she was still in my head for some reason. Um, and I just wanted to know more about her and who she was and how she fitted into everything. And, and how about the fact that this, if I'm not mistaken, I think this is actually in the questions, but this is the first time you've written a police detective, really, yeah. as a main character. How was that? Well, that was an accident. So, right, I am a notoriously lazy writer. I cannot do research. I, I only want to write about things that oh are God, actually already inside my own head or things that I could just Google in 30 seconds flat and get an answer to. I can't, the thought of reading a whole book or having to talk to an expert or spending a day in a prison or going to visit some town that I want to write about and doing a street by street tour of it. I don't want to do any of those things. I just want to write the book. Um, so because of that reason, I do own a book called Police Procedure for Novelists or something. Um, I bought it when I started writing thrillers. It came out thrillers. like 1973. Yes, I think it's probably been um, <laughs> superseded by now. But I did buy it. I thought if I'm going to start writing thrillers, I need to know about how police procedure works. And I, I read the first page. I thought, I'm not doing this. I just, <laughs> I can't. I can't possibly countenance this. So I've been quite clever in all my novels in the thriller genre in managing to keep the police at bay. They're just sort of over there somewhere and they occasionally <laughs> pop up and they're usually really um, hopeless um, and they're, so, they're always like, blaming budget cuts for the fact that they can't do the work they want to do to solve the crime. So then I leave the, my characters to solve the crime instead. And in the writing of this, I introduce a detective in the very first chapter called Samuel Ousu. And he was going to be, I was going to come back to him at various points throughout the book for like half a page max and just show him as he, so he's investigating the discovery of a bag of bones on the shores of the River Thames that belonged to a character from the family upstairs. And I was just gonna come back to him for half a page here and there, just to see how his investigation was going. But he just wouldn't get off the page, this guy. He was Love just that. like, yeah. he was like, no, I'm here, you've made me, I'm a detective, <laughs> I'm gonna do my job and you're gonna stick around. And so I had to write a detective with no idea about how detectives do their job. Um, so I was, I just kept a very light touch with him. I didn't, I didn't give him a complicated backstory or a complicated personality. Um, I didn't spend much time with him interacting with his colleagues. I kept him very much on his own. He's quite solitary for a London detective. Um, and I just focused in on him looking at the evidence and talking to people and how he responded to what he was hearing and seeing. And I haven't had any feedback yet from detectives telling me that he's all wrong. Um, <laughs> you but, get that even when you're right. Yeah, well, that's that. true. <laughs> that is true. And I mean, yeah, police procedure is so complicated yeah. and it varies from region to region as well. What, that, what yes. works for one police force wouldn't work for another. Yeah, so somebody's always going to say What I love about this is I think you're the only writer I've ever heard be besides myself, <laughs> who tells people who are trying to write books, don't do so much research. Yes. Everybody else you will ever hear up here will <laughs> tell you research. And besides the reason that Lisa gives that we are inherently lazy, <laughs> 
it's that, first of all, have you ever read that book, I always say, that, you know, because, first of all, research is more fun than writing for a lot of people. So, you wake up in the morning, I'm gonna write a scene on Fifth Avenue, New York, oh, but I have to go to New York and smell the hot dog stands and walk the street. No, no, you've been there before. Yeah. Write it from memory yeah. and then do the research later. And the other thing is, when you read that book where the writer got fell in love with his research, right? And he keeps slowing down the story, giving you little factoids. Yes. Not a problem with us because we don't know anything. Yeah. <laughs> we are on a need to know don't basis. Don't need to know. Yeah, someone, someone gave me a good expression for that style of writing the other day, that over-researched style of writing, showing your homework. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I, that's exactly what it feels like. And you can see when a, when a writer's done it. Right. You're like, okay, you spent half a day of your life researching this, so you have put it in this book right. to make that half a day of research worth your right. while. And it doesn't even need to be there. We didn't need to know that. Well, we are from the hum a few bars and fake Yeah, exactly. Research, exactly. So a lot of this book is set in Chicago. <laughs> and and guess, one day guess, she'll go to Chicago. Guess how long in my 54 years on this planet I have spent in Chicago? One hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have set a quarter of this book in Chicago and it's, uh, it's a very vague, it's a very vague representation of, of Chicago and I don't mention street names, I don't mention real restaurants. It's just, yeah, I did a bit, I Google, I did, did a Google. Did a Google Earth I did a Google, oh, yeah, 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 and I just thought, oh, they've got quite a lot of Art Nouveau architecture in Chicago. <laughs> I'll have an Art Nouveau building here and, uh, yeah, you don't need to. And the that. reader doesn't need you to have done it either and I think that's the main thing. Yeah, I, I, I guess sometimes when I do that, like I'll just, I need a town in Indiana, so I'll <laughs> pick one on a map and then I'll get letters from them saying, how did you know so much yeah. about <laughs> Yes. <laughs> you know, you definitely the hum a few bars and yeah. fake it yeah. school of research. But yeah, you don't want to necessarily slow the story down. Yes. And when you're writing, you don't want anything to get in your way. You can do that, yeah. the cute thing later on. Yes. Right? All right. So we have our, our little start, our little idea. So are you um, what we call, they call a pantser or a planner? Yeah. Are you an outliner? Do you know the ending yeah. before you begin? So I am an absolute pantser. I think if there's, <laughs> if there's a, 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 you know, one one degree, one oh, end of the spectrum right. to the other. I'm that end. Right. Um, I don't have. You're a pants, aren't you? Mostly. Yeah. I know the but, ending. Ah, oh, that's right. Know you know the ending. ending. No, I don't have a clue. I just start a book <laughs> with two or three things that interest me, and then try and find a way to link them all together. Um, and I'm really good at starting books. I bet you're really good at starting books. Do you just start? Starting, yeah. Starting yeah. and ending are good. It's yeah. the Stuff in between. So when it comes to the day, the day that, so there's designated day, designated by myself because I am the boss of when I start writing books, I just, there's the blank screen and I just start typing words onto it and I don't really worry too much about what it's, where it's all headed. Um, as long as I know that at some point I'm going to reach the next thing that I was quite interested in writing about. And, you know, characters just arrive as and when I need them as well. You know, so for example, with the family upstairs, I knew that I had Lucy. Lucy was my key character, right. even though she's not the, probably the main character in the book. Um, but then I realized I needed other people to help tell her story about what had happened in this house in Chelsea. Um, 30 years ago and so people just arrived just literally in the nick of time <laughs> so Henry so Henry Lamb is one of the main characters in the family upstairs and the family remains and I'd already introduced Lucy and Libby um, and I realized I needed the perspective the point of view of a character who had lived in this house 30 years before and I just thought well I've already got two female um, narrators here I need to you know, mix it up a bit. So I thought I'll, I'll have a man because it's so much easier from the reader's point of view if everybody isn't the same gender because it can get confusing with all those points of view. Um, and then I thought, well, what about a boy? Um, and two seconds later, I was writing Henry Lamb in the first person. And I'd only just decided that I was going to be writing his chapters from um, his perspective. Wait, there's no like, like the Yale Doctor has a quote on writing where he said that light, writing is like driving at night in the fog with just your headlights on. Yeah. You can see a little bit ahead of you, yeah. but you make the whole journey that way. How far ahead of you are you seeing? Because from the sound yeah. of it, you're seeing it like one sentence ahead of you. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Is that real? Are you, are you really Sometimes that, uh, I know where a chapter is headed, right. but quite often I don't. Wow. And I, I just have to chapter. feel my way through that chapter, like the headlights shining through the fog at night. Yes, right. I have to feel my way through that chapter line by line. And quite often, just think. How, how long does first draft take you? March to December, but I take the summer off. So 
I lo I write a thousand words the, a day. the Europeans, like some yeah. of them is like March to December, <laughs> yeah. pretty much. <laughs> no, it used to be the school the school holiday, which yeah. in the UK is only six weeks. Oh, okay. So I used to take that six weeks because I didn't want to like have to sort out childcare for my children during the summer holiday. So I would okay. stop work when they finish school and start again. Uh, they, they don't have those dates now to, to work around. Um, so yeah, so. I write a thousand words a day and my books are about a hundred thousand words long and I probably dump about 20,000 words while I'm writing. So let's say I write 120,000 words. A thousand words a day, that's 120 days. That's right, I did yeah. the math in my head. I don't know yeah. Right, yeah, okay. So you actually do like a thousand, do you stop at a thousand? Or do you, will some days do 3,000, some no, days do 400? No, see, this is something that I have found um, writing without a plan um, is, it, 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 I, if I write too many words in one sitting, I'll quite often go off on the wrong tangent or write myself into a corner <laughs> because I need to get a certain amount of words down on the page and then walk away from it. So what about you? Are you, no, I'm not, do, you just, do you just I keep going? I count words. I mean, I, 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 it's just by field now, but some yeah. days toward the end of a book, I, I write the last, this book, the last 40 pages I wrote in one day. Oh my it's God. It's not a pretty day, yeah. you don't want to hang with me. <laughs> <laughs> my kids are like, throw daddy a banana and run, <laughs> kind of a thing. But yeah, I, I'm a streak writer. Okay. Is, by the way, you always say, uh, the writers are a bit like we have the Hebrew faith. Ask 10 of them their opinion, you're going to get 11 different answers. <laughs> so this is an example uh, yes. of really, you know, there's a lot of things we do the same yeah. and a lot we don't. So do you wait until the entire first draft is over before you start doing yeah. any editing? Yeah. There's another thing we have different. Oh my! I, I rewrite do, every day. Yeah. So, but do you rewrite from the? Do you think like so? You're on page 180, and you suddenly realise that you need to do something on page 30, no, really. or do you just edit what you wrote the last day? Usually, last day. So yes. instead of writing like this, I write like this. I kind of go back. Yes. And reread. Yes, that I. Oh no, it, I do like, that. It's like a running start. Kind yeah. Of. Okay, you do a little bit. Yes. No, I'll I'll re I'll look I'll much. reread the first thing I do, and I think. Pretty much, this is one of the few things that every writer I think I know does, is the first thing you do before you start writing every day is read what you wrote the day before. Because you're terrified as complete shit. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Let's be honest here. We're, we're, right? Yeah, and that's another really interesting thing is how you can spend a day writing and think everything I wrote today was complete shit, but tomorrow I'm gonna, like, I can come back to it and make it brilliant. And then you read it the following day and you're like, actually it wasn't complete shit at all, there's nothing wrong with it. Okay. Yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, it's, it's really true, yeah. and, and, and writers who do think it's good right away are usually crappy writers. Yes, absolutely. Only bad writers yes, think they're good. Yes, exactly, correct. The rest of us are, are like crazy, yes. correct? Yes, that is absolutely correct, right. yes. So give us, let's, let's do your work day for a second. Do yeah. you have a, do you, are you a, do you have an office? Do you work in the same spot every day? Do you wake up at 6 a.m., have your coffee at 6.15, start at 6.30? Are you very regimented? And I guess some days you're done in an hour, some days you're done yeah. in two or three hours. So yes. Give us your day. All right, so my day is, let's go for a school day. I wake up, drive my youngest daughter to school. I'm back home by 9 a.m. And then I spend two hours doing my social media, um, which is quite quite an undertaking. Um, so that takes me to 11. Then I spend from 11 till 1.30 doing replying to emails and doing anything that is involved with my job but isn't writing a book. Then I walk my dog. Then I have something to eat. And then at about 2, 2.30, I start writing. Um, wow, and I'm exhausted already. Are you really? <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. And then, like you say, if I can get my thousand words done in an hour, I'm gone. I'm not hanging around. So you don't get started on writing until like around yeah. two thirty. Yes, two thirty. Sometimes three o'clock if things have run over. When I was under thirty, I could do that. Now I'm, I'm eight a.m. Yeah. If I'm, by, by by noon, I'm like nap time. You know what I mean? Okay. I can't. I can't. I do the social media and the other stuff um, later. You do on. that later. See, yeah, I can't. I, I I can't focus unless I've got a clean deck. I'm just I'm I'm too distracted by the thought of all the things I need to be doing once I finish writing. Are you so, always in the same spot? Right. So I used oh, to yeah. write um, in coffee shops, um, and then obviously I could no longer write in coffee shops for various well-known reasons. Um, and then I was able to return to coffee shops after lockdown, and I didn't want to. I just got so used to writing at home. 
so I was trying to write at the kitchen table because I don't have an office at home. I bet you've got an amazing office. I do not. I have a what have you got? Office. It's just like in my, my daughter's old bedroom. That oh, okay. I have this old desk in there. It's always a mess. It's an awful place. Oh, okay. It's dark. Oh, it's dingy. It's oh, depressing. that makes me feel better. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah. I don't have an office at all, although when my daughters leave home, maybe I can appropriate one of their rooms. Um, <laughs> and oh, she's still in there. No. Okay. Oh, she's <laughs> <laughs> Honey, go to sleep. <laughs> That's working. <laughs> yeah, so I did try and write at the, coffee, at the kitchen table, but the kitchen, the hub of the home, right. people kept coming in and making food and talking to me. Um, and it nearly, so, you know, started to sour familial relationships because <laughs> I just never appreciated seeing any member of my family because <laughs> they always walked in at the wrong time. So I got myself a 20 pounds, so, um, 20 UK pounds, not weight pounds, um, fold up desk from Amazon and put it in the corner of my bedroom. And that's where you work. So I work at his little foldy up desk in the corner of my bedroom. It's fine. So why, you know, because I've always, before COVID, same thing. I would be in different coffee shops, including sometimes here, downstairs here. Oh. And I would change up a lot. Why is that? Why, why, do you like, why did you like that and why is it okay not? And, and why, why do you like being home now? Is it being lazy again, do you think? It is being change? lazy. Yeah. I can't be bothered to <laughs> unplug my laptop, put it in a se separate bag, carry it all the way. Yes, it is. It's totally So they all exactly think that we're so like, that we work yes. hard and we're disciplined <laughs> to get this stuff done. They don't realize how lazy yes, we are. Yes, yes, absolutely. You know, our whole life we're trying not to. That's the reason we do this, right? Because yeah. we, wanna, we cannot handle a real job. We get to sit down all day and not go anywhere. <laughs> and it's just, it's like, just a, yeah. It's so great. It's so great. Right. Yeah, I feel we should high five now, but maybe that's too much, <laughs> too much. <laughs> Well, I, always, I, I say oftentimes that one of the things, besides the three things that make a writer, inspiration, obviously, yeah. desperation, you have to do the work, right? You have to actually sit in the yes. chair and write. But the third is desperation. That is, I'm not fit to do anything else. Yes. Like hold a real job no. or be out in public. No. I'm forgetful, we're lazy, we're disorganized. Can't that, delegate. Yeah, and, that's, <laughs> and that fear drives us back to the computer to, yeah. to write. Do you have that too? I wouldn't call it fear. Um, because, yeah, there's nothing else I'd want to do. But if anybody ever said, if anybody ever took writing away from me, right. I'd be lost. I'd flounder. I mean, before I started writing novels, I was a very um, average, would be kind secretary. Um, and that was it. I didn't have any you other. Were kind? No, what? No, that, <laughs> I'm saying that's a kind oh, adjective. Kind. I said, I said to nice. say that I was average okay. would be a kind, kind of, I got judgment. Okay. And yes, um, yeah. So I was 27 when I started writing my first novel, and I just been I just lost my job as a secretary. Um, and up, up until that point, I didn't have a career plan. I didn't have there was I wasn't good at anything. Right. I wasn't good at anything. Um, I hadn't been good at anything at school apart from writing. Um, so I, I, and this is a terrible thing to say, but in those mid-twenties years, um, I pinned all my hopes on meeting a rich man. <laughs> because that was the only Same. way. Same. <laughs> <laughs> because that was the only way I could imagine having a comfortable life going forward, because I just didn't feel I didn't have any capacity to provide that for myself because I didn't have any skills or ambition or drive or any need to achieve anything. Um, and then I wrote a book and then I, I found the it. thing that I was good at and the thought of somebody taking that away from me and having to find it's some terrifying. other, it's just terrifying. Yeah. That's one of the other things that we're lucky about, I was thinking I have a friend who's a pro baseball player and he had to retire, right? Like, we, And I'm like, suppose we had to stop doing this when we were, you know, after 10 years or eight years or whatever it is. You just, yeah. what would we do? Of course, yes. They yeah. have to give up their beloved. Right, we can do it The until, thing that they're good at, yeah. the thing they're famous for, the right. grace, can you imagine if graceful, you amazing, impressive thing that everybody... This is more like a psychiatric oh, uh, therapy God. session. And they apologize. have to give it up. They, have to, yeah. they haven't got any choice. Right, so that's what I'm saying. That's so, yeah, and that is... so lucky. Yeah, so I've got a friend who, um, when, he, when her new boyfriend told his friend that he was going out with an author, he said, oh, that's great. The brilliant thing about a writer is they can keep going forever. 
and are you always all right we're we talking retirement plans <laughs> <laughs> no but they can i know it's true there's no there's no and, it, cut and off you're never point. too late look at yeah. uh, when the crawdad sings yeah. julie owens is 73 years old yes yeah yeah so I mean, you can never for those who are trying to write it's not like if you one of you guys want to be a pro basketball player yeah. you're done all right you're, done, yeah. if you're over 21 or 19 that dream is over but i don't care how old you are in this room if you're someone who likes to write, it could still, it could still happen. Yes. That's the weird thing. Yeah, and, it, and, and another beautiful thing about um, the writing, uh, the, the world of being a writer, is that even if you were already a writer, you still, every, you're still only one book away from something magical yeah. happening. There's always, every book that you write is imbued with hope and possibility, and yeah. it never feels like you're just going through the motions and just shoving it out there to fulfill some sort of contractual obligation. It always feels like you could be about to write the greatest book you've ever written or the book that has a big impact or so do you, it's just. Do you have this too, like there's times I'm writing and I'll be writing, I'm writing a book right now and I'll be writing it going, oh my God, this is such shit. Yeah. It <laughs> yeah. was so good before. Yes, what yes, to me? exactly. Within five minutes I go, this is genius. Yes. Someone's gonna read that ad book and yeah. I did this work of Shakespearean proportions. Yes. A chance? Do you have that? Too? Oh, absolutely! Five minutes, right? It can happen minute to yes, minute, right? Yes, yes, it can happen. Yeah. Uh, yeah my husband finds it hilarious. <laughs> right. He finds it absolutely hilarious, and now I have to come to him and sort of say, "Yes, I know. I always say this, but right. they're, like, yeah. they're like mouthing yeah, the words exactly, with you. Exactly, exactly. Oh, you haven't heard this one before, right? Yeah. <laughs> this book's never going to work. Let me yeah. guess. Let me guess. This book's never going to work. You've lost it. Yeah. You're going to have to get a real job. You're going to wake up early in the morning. And go to his pharmacy and sell pens, and I get it. You get the whole thing. You have all the panic stuff going through. You need, by the way, I, I don't know your husband, but I'm wondering if the same. You do need. A, it does help to have a supportive spouse. Yes. Yeah. Although, how impressed is your spouse? Impressed? Not at all. No, not at all. Oh my God! None of them are impressed. No, with no. Me. That is Ew, that's dad, another remarkable you know. thing. Is particularly, I think, when you do a job that you can do in the corner of a bedroom. No, not impressed. It's at all. just like. <laughs> yeah, they're kind of like. Yeah. My kids just thought, like, dad plays computer games yeah. and stuff. And just, that's what, what does dad do? Like, all the other dads are getting on a train at Ridgewood yeah. Station. What's our dad do? Yeah. You know, they, they just couldn't quite figure it out. Yeah. And couldn't then they, they do, and they're still not impressed. No, they're not impressed. No, no. no. For those who follow me on social media, like, my daughters are always going to comment on a picture. If I put a picture of myself on, yeah. it's either ew yeah. <laughs> or can you not? Yeah. <laughs> Those are the two go-to comments from my two. Right. The sons just will ignore it, but they, yeah, no, yeah. you're not. They're not impressed by anything. No, no. Do, but they are. In other words, they are supportive. They didn't. They are. Yes. Yeah. They're happy about it. And, do and any of them read like your books? They all read them. That's oh, the funny thing. They okay. all. They're all. My youngest is now 21, so they all read them. They all read them right away, and they all like them. That I will say, as, as egomaniacally as that sounds, they all read them right away, and they all and they all like them, and so that's that's good. Um, but they don't, not that impressed. They're a little more now, but they literally was like when a kid. They kind of like just didn't kind of kind of yeah. get it. It's yeah. like um, I was also the only dad. Like despite all of our modern day stuff in this area, I was still one of the very few dads who was picking up the kids and dropping them off. Because let's face it, the women get that end of the stick. They do. And I was able to use it because like you know, people here will know what I'm talking about. Like if I were to forget the lunch and bring it in late or forget my kid, I was the cute dad trying with the <laughs> office ladies. Oh, it's so sweet, you forgot the lunch again. It's come. And a mother did it and they would be calling Dyfus. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. It was that kind of thing. I like, like Mr. Coben, yes, your son has been sitting outside waiting for you for four hours. Do you think I'm pick him up? Like if mom does it, they're calling Dyfus. Yeah. Is that a, I, I, play, I play the dumb blonde. You're like, oh, I just forgot, you know. <laughs> I'm a dumb man, I can just get away with it. But anyway, we're getting off on tangent. Okay, I have another, I have a lo I have another question for you that your, that your publisher asked, and I love this because I be hate trick. this question. Okay. So I would, if, they ever, if my publisher would put this down, I would be okay. really mad. You don't have so to ask it. That's why I'm asking you, because <laughs> I hate this question. Okay. Do you have a favorite book? Oh. Or is it always the one you just finished? I shouldn't have, I'm gonna say, do you have a favorite book? I hate that question. One of you was going to ask it later, right? So, by the way, prepare a couple of questions. I'm going to ask you, and if none of you raise your hand, I'm just going to call on you. <laughs> and not all of you have done the reading, so thanks. Okay, what's your, your favorite book? That's all the right. So it is very yeah. true that your favorite book is the one you're promoting, yes. not the one you've just written that you, yeah, that right. you haven't. Because we're self-involved and yeah. we're trying to yes, promote. Yes, right but there. it is. It's the one that you're promoting. Right. Is always your favorite. But going into the backlist, I do like the house we grew up in. Anybody read the house we grew up in? Yes. Oh. 
<laughs> Excellent, cool. Uh, I do like that one very, very much. And um, yeah, what? I don't know if it's my favorite, but I've got a soft spot for it. Why? So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Why? Why? Yes. Uh, because I think I it's one of the very, very rare books where I pulled off exactly what I was hoping to pull off when I started writing it. Because you know how books just dissolve into puddles of of right. failure. The, yeah. they, they, they exist in your head in this perfect, perfect state and, and then it all kind of just dissipates oh. and just once it's actually on the screen, it's like, oh, it's never as glorious as a thing that was inside your head. Or, or you start writing a book thinking it's going to be one thing and it turns out to be something completely different. But this was, I knew what it was going to be. I, want, I knew what I wanted it to be and it turned out to be what I wanted it to be. And I really quite like it, that's it. I also contend that one of the reasons we, all, we often choose our current book yeah. isn't just that it's self-serving, which it is. Yeah. <laughs> and we're better hardback than paperback or all those things, but that it's the thing that's closest to you. So like, it's like, I would say, suppose you wrote a paper when you were in college, right? That you thought was brilliant. And now you find it at home and you read one and go, wow, this is crap. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, because it's so far away. Yes. You think of yourself when you were 25 or 30, yeah. like, what did that idiot know? And so you know more now. So the fact that it's closer to you yeah. makes it somewhat better. I never yes. reread my own books, of course. No, I, mean, I never no. reread my own books. I've had no. to do it for the Netflix shows. Oh my God, it's torture. Don't yes. do it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Sometimes I'm even going, where the hell am I going with this? <laughs> Who is this character? You know, like, I forget after all. Because you've written 20, 21 books? 21 now, yeah. 21 yeah. books. Yeah. How many have you written? I think 30 wow. something. 34, yeah. maybe? Yeah. 33? I lose track. That's you know, How cool are we? Yeah. We're amazing. <laughs> we have over 50 books together. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> right, was one, was one, oh, I wanted to also ask the, question, the first question, because I'm sure they'll yell at me if I don't. So you were kind of hinting at it before. You lost your job. You're going to start writing. Can you tell the story about how you started on a bet? Oh yeah, yes, and this is this is true. Um, so yeah, so I was 27 years old. I just lost my job as a secretary, and shortly thereafter, I went on holiday with my new boyfriend, um, the rich one who was going to yes, Sweep <laughs> yeah, you away. yeah, take you away from all this. <laughs> yeah, um, and I found myself up late one night with one of his friends. Um, we were both really drunk and we started having this conversation about what I was going to do when I got back to London because I didn't have a job to go back to. And I said, I'm gonna sign up with some temping agencies. And she said, is that what you wanna do? Do you wanna be a secretary? I said, well, yeah, I don't really know what else to do. She said, there must be some dream that you've always had or some other job that you want to do. And I said, well, I've always wanted to write a novel. But I th at that point in my life, I was very much of the, of the opinion that that's something you did when you were middle-aged, that you didn't, like 20, 27 year old flibberty gibbets didn't <laughs> didn't sit down and write novels it felt sort of audacious and ridiculous um but because i was drunk and because she was you know leading me into this i said i'd like to write a novel so she insisted on making a bet with me um she said just write three novels a uh, three novels three chapters of a novel and if you do that, I'll take you out for dinner to your favorite restaurant. And we shook hands and um, yeah, and I did that. I got back to London. I wrote the three chapters. She read them. She said, these are great. You should send them to some literary agents. I was like, okay, right, whatever. And so I did send those three chapters out to 10 literary agents. And I got nine rejection letters and I got one letter that came three months later and completely given up on her at that point. Um, saying it needs a lot of work and I don't like your font uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I'd like to see the rest so yeah so then I wrote the rest and that was my first novel and she took you to dinner you were able to supersize she your took meal. me for dinner yeah <laughs> we don't do supersize in England <laughs> <No>. <laughs> one size of dinner 